So I got my results back from uh, the Genographic Project and they substantiated a lot of things that I know about my family. What I also did was I submitted um, my DNA profile to Family Tree DNA. So I'm here getting ready to go into the National Geographic Genographic Project and here's my cat and my dog hanging out with me. Of course, trying to distract me from what I'm doing. So this is what it looks like. And then what you'll do is you go into the website underneath your genetic journey and you put in your kit number. And I have two kit numbers, so I'm going to show you the results of both. Damn it. Here's the spot where you put in your kit number. I'm going to enter that and uh, show you my page of how I came out of Africa and became such a white boy. <laughs> And as you can see here, um, you should be able to see this very clearly, they show Africa. All of these little uh, tan off branches are little off branches of migrations that uh, contribute to my mother's mother's DNA. But the main branch is coming from Africa up through maybe across the Red Sea into, you know, Saudi Arabia, that area, around Jerusalem, up near, you know, the Caspian Sea and ultimately into Spain, Italy, and England. And then the other off branches end up in India, um, China, all over Africa. And those are actually uh, contributing DNA markers um, that are showing through my mother's 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 mother's. And my mother's mother was actually, I think, Irish. So it would make sense that ultimately she would end up in England, you know, via Spain. But they also give a description, and I'll show that to you real quick, of each little marker point. Um, as you see, the L1, L2, L3, the N, the R, the pre-HV, the HV, and the H. It shows the migration back towards uh, the British Isles and Spain and Northern Italy uh, after the Ice Age, which is why we ultimately ended up there. So the first uh, haplogroup for my mother is haplogroup H, which came from Africa to Eurasia, and then it shows a breakdown of all the H haplotypes um, that are represented represented in your uh, your subgroup. You know that makes your DNA unique to where you ended up. So they start with mitochondrial Eve, somewhere in Africa, 150,000 to 170,000 years ago. And then they continue down through all the different uh, major migration points, such as the L haplogroup, um, <clears throat> which were moving around Africa, split into two different directions, um, and then you know spread out from there. Um, and then they give you a breakdown of each haplogroup. Then they have the haplogroup L2, which is West Africa, haplogroup L3, which is out of Africa. And that's about 80,000 years ago. And then they say that there's the next haplogroup, which is N. Um, and then they go on to your haplogroup R, which spread out. And they say that they go to the Near East, ended up in India, etc., etc. Another group, haplogroup pre HV, which is in the Near East, haplogroup HV which is the Near East and beyond, and then haplogroup H, which is your branch of the tree. And then this migration um, comprises 40 to 60 percent of the gene pool of most European populations. In Roman Athens, for example, a frequency of H is around 40 percent and exhibits similar frequencies throughout Western Europe. And then it breaks it all down for you. It's very cool. So it tells you um, <clears throat> exactly where they went and for instance it will give you a little uh, example of what was happening in the world at the time you know the ice age droughts uh, migrations of animals because of a um, drought period or a wet period that's caused by the advance of the ice age and then ultimately the ice age uh, melting back and warming up and uh, 
retreating a little bit and allowing people to go all the way throughout Europe, which at one point in time was covered up with ice and really hard to inhabit. It wasn't like it was never inhabited, but it was ex essentially like the North Pole, you know, or very the very tips of Canada. It took very hardy people to survive there. But people did eventually work their way around and as they adapted to the cold. So that's my mother's side, and I'm going to show you my father's side. And here you will see my father's DNA map, and if you notice, my father's DNA map travels in a very similar fashion uh, to my mother's because they're from similar genetic stock, you know, with similar ancestries, um, being, you know, Europeans, you know, Irish, Scottish, French, you know, background. And of course, then it tells you where all your little subgroups are, you know, like for instance, I have some Jewish in there that's showing up and some Islamic uh, blood that might be showing up, some Asian blood that's showing up. And it doesn't give it to you definitively, but it shows you your major migration routes, you know, up and through and then over past the Ice Age. And it gives a similar story. What is interesting to note about the men as opposed to the women is that female DNA goes back um, several you know, tens of thousands of years beyond men. If you notice, the guy's uh, DNA is 31,000 to 79,000 years ago, and that's an approximation. Women's goes back to 200 to 300,000 years ago. So we have more female um, lines outside of Africa than we do male. And apparently there would have been a bottleneck of some kind that caused um, there to be a few line of males, but more line of females. Yeah which is very, very interesting. And there you have it. Now, what I'm finding very interesting about both of their journeys is uh, when they break it down, they tell you when the Cro-Magnon came into being, and Cro-Magnon was essentially a uh, cultural interaction between Neanderthals who were already out of Africa at an earlier stage and Neanderthals. And everyone in the world, according to new genetic studies of Neanderthal DNA that they are beginning to break down and have started breaking down in the last year, um, every person that is outside of Africa of any race that didn't stay inside Africa has about 3% of Neanderthal DNA. And I'm sure that differs from person to person because it would matter how much of that uh, Neanderthal DNA stock is in you. So I would imagine some people are only one, some people are probably five, six, you know, or more. Um, but yes, it's very interesting that they're unlocking that right now. And I would like to contribute my DNA to that as well, because I'm quite sure that I would be intermingled with that stock as well. And uh, I just thought it was pretty cool. You know, little Neanderthals running around with bag little pipes that they made out of antlers and braiding their hair and not being as primitive as everybody thought they were, you know, living in caves. And then all of a sudden the two societies interact with each other and they have a flourishing of art and music and culture and society because of the influx of those two cultures together. Sleeping dogs, sleeping cats, thunderstorm outside. They're kind of bored by what I'm doing. Now when you submit your um, DNA publicly, which you don't have to do when you enter the Genographic Project, but what I but I chose to on both sides of my family, then you can also uh, submit it to Family Tree DNA. And what's fascinating about Family Tree DNA is they compare you to other people with your genetic matches. And I'll show that to you in just a moment. Um, I'm going to try not to show it closely because I don't want you to see people's names. I think that's an invasion of their privacy, but I want you to... Um, have a concept of what happens here and how they match you up. So I'll show that to you. Over here you'll see that they have uh, projects and then they have matches, contacts, etc, etc like that. And then up here they have like your home. You have a home page that you set up and uh, then you can actually map your ancestral locations, you know, based upon what you know. And then there is highlighted matches. That's what I'm going to go to. So what you're seeing here, I blocked off the markers that actually have names on it. Um, I tested up to my 12th marker, and what they do is they give you um, people that are identical matches to your 12th marker, and then people that are uh, like one to two um, mutations away from you. And what's interesting is they have the 27 marker, the 37 marker, the 111 marker. I'm going to do the 111 marker eventually because that will show all of my 
DNA strands uh, from all of my different parent groups because in the uh, genographic project when I took the 12 marker all they're tracing is your father's 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 father your mother's mother mother's mother so it doesn't um, include a lot of those subgroups and branches you know that might comprise some of your interesting background genetic but when you do the 111 marker what happens is they take it and they break it into percentages of where your DNA matches other people in the world for instance if you're Jewish or if you're um, African American they'll show you what tribes you belong to um, or what groups of people you belong to in the world with a very similar um, genetic marker or an exact gen genetic marker on more strands and then they break it into percentages for you so you know what percentage of each of those in your DNA strand is representing your actual DNA makeup which is really really cool but anyway so I'm gonna go and show you how you take the ones that are above the 12 um, like I said, in the 12 marker range, the ones that had no mutation were exactly the same as me. Several of them didn't have my last name. In fact, I think there's only one person that has my last name. Now, one deviation away, I have multiple people with my last name, which proves that I'm part of the cheek group, which is a you know a genetic group from um, England, France, you know, et cetera, et cetera, a Platagene line mixed in there. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so multiple people at one deviation away with my marker, and then surprisingly about 15 people with an exact match to me that have different last names and I'm going to get their last names not their first names so you can't stalk them and I'm going to show you how you can research them online. Here's a fantastic website for anybody that is a descendant potentially of a uh, person that would have been a noble or in the court of Henry VIII, Henry VII, um, James the first. This is called A Who's Who of Tudor Women. It's compiled by Kathy Lynn Emerson. It is a fantastic resource. It shows pictures and funeral effigies so that you can get an actual image of somebody who might be your relative. I'm going to show you one of my relatives on here. Elizabeth the first and her brother Edward, who became Edward uh, the King of uh, England after um, Henry the Eighth and before uh, Bloody Mary, you know, who was, you know, of course, Catholic. So this is my great ancestor, Mary Hill. She was married to Sir John Cheek. And then after John Cheek died in captivity, when uh, Mary became the Queen of England and started killing off Protestants <laughs> um, in a retaliation, you know, against her very conservative Protestant brother and father, um, she remarried and she was quite wealthy. She was also the daughter of a vintner. And what you have to imagine is that owning a, a winery in England would be the equivalent of being probably like an oil baron or something today. Uh, wine was very rare. Anyway, but she looks a lot like me. I was really just freaked out when I saw her picture and you will see pictures like this all over this page. Um, and she is my direct line ancestor and she, she has other children by a second husband who are related to me through her but who are not in my family line which might potentially account for um, some people having a genetic match to me um, on family tree DNA. Long story short, I looked up uh, some of the names and there's, for instance, a guy named Coverdell, a guy with the last name Lamb, uh, somebody with the last name Cheek who obviously is my direct relative, that's a given, um, someone named Cravens and someone named Martin. And Martin actually wrote to me and was asking me how um, we could possibly be related. And what I told him is it's the most likely the Platagene line. But the other truth of it is, is that surnames came into effect in the 1200s. And a lot of people would have ultimately, many generations before that, potentially been related to each other, closely related to each other, maybe even descended from brothers or sisters of a family and adapted to different last names. So my name might be Cheek, his name might be Martin. They may have ended up in the court of Henry VIII, been well connected, had different nickname last names that became their official last names on documents and everything. And then ultimately you get a surname that your family has for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Anyway, but that's going on. what's going on with me. There are lots of different resources uh, that you can look through. Uh, one of the resources is the Platagene role of the Blood Royals. It gives an account of different um, ancestry that was noble through England. And if you happen to have a noble connection of any kind, you can travel, you can, you know, do that. And of course, there's um, uh, familytree.com and... Uh, those types of websites, you know, which can give you like shipping and uh, 
immigration documents. But what's really fascinating is, uh, to my surprise, my family on my mom and my dad's side has been here since the 1600s. So they were early colonists and they came from predominantly England and Ireland. And it's really not that hard for me to find a connection to my family uh, because I was able to make that leap. But uh, very, very interesting. I would encourage anybody to do it. I just find it really fascinating. And when I do the 111 uh, DNA marker, I'll let you see that too, because that will be really interesting to see all of that. What I know of my family history to be substantiated through my DNA map. Now, especially that I know that I'm not the illegitimate son of anyone. <laughs>